the, the, the concept of the franchise was that originally, of course, it started off with the two detectives. So it was uh, because of my my work in uh, film and television. Um, I borrow a lot and am and, 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 and inspired. I love movies, I love television. So I'll take a general concept. So um, the first book was conceived sort of to be close to the movie Seven, where you have these two, um, the salt and pepper team, an African-American cop along with an Irish Italian American cop, and they are the best closers of serial uh, killers in, in, in New York. So so you had that. So that's a great franchise right there. But then just to balance it out more and it just organically became more interesting to me, I wanted to include a Jewish FBI agent um, who's female. And so the three of them form this really, obviously the two partners are very close and they're also best friends. But then to throw this third entity in who doesn't quite fit with them, but you see their relationship evolve as they investigate these horrific crimes. Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you. But navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello, Reflectives, and welcome to episode 329 of the Stark Reflections podcast. This is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. In today's episode, I have an interview with Eric LaSalle. Now, actor, director, producer Eric LaSalle is best known to worldwide television audiences for his award-winning portrayal of the commanding Dr. Peter Benton on the critically acclaimed and history-making medical drama ER. Educated at Juilliard and NYU's Tisch School of the Arts, his credits range from Broadway to film roles opposite Eddie Murphy in Coming to America, Robin Williams in One Hour Photo, and Hugh Jackman in Logo. LaSalle has maintained a prolific acting career while at the same time working steadily as a director, taking the helm for HBO, Showtime, NBC, Fox, and CBS. He remains a valued member of the Dick Wolf Entertainment Camp after four years as executive producer and director on Chicago PD, in addition to directing episodes of Law & Order and Law & Order Organized Crime. As a writer, LaSalle is the author of several critically acclaimed thrillers published in 2022 and 2023. He's also written an episode of The Twilight Zone, which made WGA's list of 101 best-written TV series. He lives in Los Angeles, California. And Eric joined me in the virtual Stark Reflection studio to talk about a lifelong passion for storytelling and writing, which is what led to his career in television and movies. And we get into detail about his new book, Laws of Annihilation, which is releasing in late October 2023. And it's the third book in the Martyr Maker series, which is Laws of Depravity, Laws of Wrath, and of course, this new one, Laws of Annihilation. And that's coming up later in this episode. But first, let's hear a word about this episode's sponsor. If you're looking for ways to get your audiobook out into the market, look no further than Findaway Voices. Findaway Voices has opportunities for authors and small publishers to get their works into more than 43 retail and library channels, including Spotify. Because Spotify acquired the company Findaway just a couple years ago, and they're leveraging all kinds of opportunities for authors, including amazing giveaway codes that you can give out two people to listen to your books on Spotify. And one of the things they recently released and announced was analytics for Spotify listens. So if you go to your Findaway Voices dashboard, and I just did for this last week, you can actually see analytics about when and how and how long and and even who in terms of high-level demographics are listening to your audiobooks. 
That's just one of many great opportunities, including promotions. And I'll talk a lot more about promotions with Find Away Voices that you can get in the personal update coming later on. But if you're looking for a professional narrator, you can find them through Voices Marketplace. And they're all listed there. You can listen to samples and you can work and collaborate with a professional narrator or if you already have the audio files, like I often do because I pay my narrators up front, you can load the audio files directly to Find Away Voices and have them do the distribution for you. Now, if you're looking for ways that you can leverage a Find Away in this and so many other ways, you can check them out over at starkreflections.ca slash findaway. And now, selected comments from recent episodes. So over at starkreflections.ca in the show notes for episode 326, rebranding and relaunching with E.L. Williams, Stanley B. Trice said, E.L. Williams had a happy and pleasant attitude to her writing that I enjoyed. I like listening to the conversation between both of you. This is what I try to be with my writing. Happy about it. Creative writing should not be stressful even if it is a business. Do you like reading what you wrote? Thank you so much, Stanley, for that comment. That is such a fantastic attitude, and I have that attitude as well. And you probably remember from comments from the recent episode, it was the advice uh, Terry Fallis uh, said about loving and being passionate about the stories that you're writing. And you can tell in this forthcoming interview with Eric that he is passionate about storytelling and passionate about the characters and the world and the tales that he spins. So just great advice. And thanks for sharing that, Stanley. Over on a Twitter or X, Beth C. Parody asked this question. Um, Mark Leslie, since you write so many eerie stories, I wonder if you've done anything in or around eerie, and you could call it eerie, she spells E-E-R-I-E, -E -E, eerie Pennsylvania. And <laughs> thank you for that, uh, Beth. Uh, not yet. Uh, I've been to Erie, Pennsylvania. I, I love the name of the uh, town. I've, I've had some craft beer in Erie, Pennsylvania. I've, I've driven through it several times uh, on my way to Cleveland, uh, for example, uh, because it's just, you know, between where I live in Waterloo, Ontario and and, and uh, Cleveland. So, you know, to get to the Overdrive Conference, etc. But um, I haven't yet. And, and there are some cool ghosty locations uh, for some of my nonfiction ghost story books. But I even had on the other side of Lake Erie, on this side of Lake Erie, the Ontario side, there's a, a wonderful town called uh, Port Dover, where on Friday the 13th, and we just recently had one in October, Friday the 13th, motorcyclists from all across North America converge on this little, you know, town, this, this uh, waterfront town on Lake Erie, beautiful beaches there. And, and I always thought it would be fun to write a novel set during a Friday the 13th weekend when there's, you know, tens of thousands of people there uh, called Murder in Dover, where a murder takes place, probably because of something that's happening with all of the people that are in town. So there's a lot more suspects. But anyways, every time I go to Port Dover, I uh, love visiting that town. Every time I go there uh, and I see the Erie Beach Hotel, I thought it'd be great to go put myself up in the Erie Beach Hotel for a week and just write. <laughs> Just get the novel done, or at least uh, get started on, on a novel like that. But no, uh, thanks uh, for the idea, Beth. I have not yet, I have not yet written uh, something about Erie, Pennsylvania. But I have I have some ideas for Lake Erie, at the very least, or a, a town on the north shores of Lake Erie. Thank you, uh, Beth, uh, for that question. And over on YouTube, where the audio for the podcast posts, and I do post occasional video uh, interviews, and there will be a video interview with Eric LaSalle posted on YouTube. Nikki uh, Gerlaine, thank you for the comment on the writing the shadow with Joanna Penn on, on the video uh, for your comment about enjoying that conversation. You can leave comments for any episode over at starkreflections.ca over the feed over on my YouTube channel at youtube.com slash if you're willing to spell Mark Leslie LaFave. <laughs> Good luck with that. Um, you can find me over on places like uh, Twitter X uh, at Mark Leslie. Uh, you can even email me and uh, leave your comments. Mark at MarkLeslie.ca. I do love your comments and your engagement and your reflections. And just a huge shout out for all of the folks who support this podcast over at patreon.com slash Stark Reflections, where for a dollar, three dollars, or five dollars a month, you get additional access to 
bonus content. You get early access to some of the interviews. You get additional reflections on other podcasts and other special bonus features from time to time. Thank you so much to all my awesome patrons who support the podcast at patreon.com slash Stark Reflections. And now for a personal update. So I alluded to this in the ad read from uh, sponsor Findaway Voices, but I recently received the audio files from Sarah Sampino, the professional narrator, who voices Gail Summers in my Canadian Werewolf series. And I'm right now in the process of editing together Sarah's work, who's doing the Gail point of view character chapters and the dialogue pieces for Gail, and I'm merging that with the audio of Scott Overton, the other professional narrator who voices Michael Andrews, his chapters and his dialogue. I love that duet narration, uh, which we did for Lover's Moon. Uh, but this means uh, that very soon the audiobook for Hex in the City, which I co-authored with Julie Strauss, will be coming out soon. And it's great because the two-book bundle in the Canadian Werewolf series uh, called Fears and Frights uh, which includes Fear and Longing in Los Angeles and Fright Night's Big City and Lover's Moon, all three of those books. Uh, and again, Lover's Moon was also co-authored with Julie Strauss and it was narrated by Scott and Sarah. They're all on sale right now in audio format at Chirp Audio Books, uh, Barnes & Noble uh, Audio, uh, Apple Books Audio, Google Play Audio Books, and they will be on sale until the end of 2023. So perfect that the next book, this uh, sixth book in the series, is going to be coming out in audio. And speaking of books in the series, I am getting ready to work on the very first draft of the next book in the series, the seventh book in the Canadian Werewolf series, during November for NaNoWriMo, or National Novel Writing Month. And in this latest book, uh, which is called Only Monsters in the Building, Michael is struggling to come to terms with the werewolf blood coursing through his body, what it has made him do, and how it has ultimately cursed his ability to have a normal relationship with the woman he loves. So, Michael heads off to a top-secret therapeutic retreat for paranormals in upstate New York. And he's in this isolated building in the middle of nowhere alongside a motley crew of other patients, which include... A mischievous fairy, a brooding vampire, a sassy mermaid, a playful werecat, and a not-so-grumpy ogre. But when their therapist is found dead, Michael and the others find themselves embroiled in a classic locked room whodunit. Will his years of writing mystery novels be enough to help him through a case where he is one of the prime suspects? And I'm going to find that out uh, when I write <laughs> Only Monsters in the Building, and that's coming out in March of 2024. And so that was, uh, I'm looking forward to digging my, or sinking my, sinking my teeth back into this werewolf series very shortly. It's been too long since Julie and I finished Hex in the City. I really, really miss that universe. And I've, I've already played with some scenes and some ideas. So I can't wait to just get into that every single day, even if I only write you know, a few hundred words every day. Uh, every day in November, I'm gonna be working on that novel. So. I was also recently a guest on two recent episodes of my good friend Julie Strauss's The Best Book Ever podcast. And so in in, in one episode, I, I raved about a new season, which is a new novel from Terry Fallis. And you may remember, of course, Terry was uh, the guest in episode 328. And then in the follow-up episode in, in uh, Best Book Ever, I couldn't help gushing non-stop <laughs> about so many fantastic Canadian authors because, you know, Terry's a Canadian author and, and I was just, you know, showing off to Julie all the amazing, and these were like all signed copies of, of books by Canadian authors that I have on the shelves behind me in my office. And so it, we had so much fun. It was just a really fun podcast. I got to share my love of reading and books and Canadian authors. And, and Julie and I always have so much fun whether we're co-authoring books together, I really hope we get to do that again, um, or, or, or just talking books, which we can do at any time because we're both, you know, avid book lovers. But if you want more of, of me reflecting on great reads, you can find it there and there'll be links 
at the show notes at starkreflections.ca. But speaking of someone who loves books, and yes, this is a teaser to something we talk about later in the interview. Speaking of a lifelong storyteller, I had the great pleasure of chatting with Eric LaSalle, and that interview is coming up right after this bumper. Eric, welcome to the Stark Reflections podcast. Oh, great to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm so excited. We're going to be talking a lot about Laws of Annihilation, which is the third book in your Martyr Maker series coming out October 24th. Yes, exactly. Yes. Okay. So uh, I, I want to get into the series and, and I'm particularly interested in what inspired you to write some pretty dark, some pretty dark, uh, beautifully dark stories. But before we get into that, I I had the great honor of of getting to see you do a keynote talk at a conference that Overdrive was organizing in August uh, called Digipalooza, where you gave a talk to a room full of, you know, some of the most wonderful people in the world, librarians. Yes. <laughs> and I was, I was so thrilled to find out that you, uh, you define yourself as a storyteller and always have, but you didn't really get in, you got into acting because you were interested in writing? Yeah, originally, so in high school, because um, I'd been writing since, uh, I don't know, eight years old. Just, I don't want to say writing, just poetry, just musings. Not saying it was good, just I was writing. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> um, But it laid a seed in me by the time I was 14 and a freshman in high school. I had this great idea that I would write this amazing play and that the drama club would perform it and I'd be I'd go on to become this big writer. And so when I showed up to the first day of auditions to explain to the drama teacher that I wanted to write, he just looked at me like I was crazy and said, I need you to audition uh, for a role or don't come back. And so <laughs> I auditioned and I got the role. And then, so that started the acting bug. And of course, which carried me, you know, for several decades. Yeah. And so, uh, and then uh, about 10 years ago, 11 years ago, I, now I've, in the course of my acting career, I've written screenplays. Um, Cause once I started directing, you start writing, you write your own short films, you go out. So I, you know, I did that. Um, I wrote some feature length scripts as well, but then this author thing sort of came back more so around, you know, 12 years ago. And, and uh, so, you know, mulled over it and then uh, was able to finally put something down about 11 years ago. It was very mediocre, uh, but then I got, you know, I just wanted to stay with it. So then I, you know, used some of it to launch the Martyr Maker series. So I kind of salvaged certain, which is what writers do, writers. I don't, I don't know that writers ever throw anything away. So, <laughs> well, cause we all think what we do is good. So anyway, so I salvaged uh, some of a story that I first wrote and, and uh, and then was able to rework it and integrate it into the Martyr Maker series. So that's that's how that came about. Cool. Uh, and, and also um, uh, at the end of uh, at the end of the first book in the series, you have sort of a prequel story. Was that prequel story there previously, or was that sort of a backstory you wanted to flesh out? It was a backstory. It was it was at the time uh, when I first published Laws of Depravity. It took a few months before I started thinking of the next book, which was Laws of Wrath. And in the meantime, people had gotten very excited about the series and they were like, when is the next book coming? So I actually wrote the prequel just as a little treat for really? the, the supporters and the people. I just wanted them to have a little something. So we originally sold it more so online. And then once the books, the self-published books were republished by source books, then we decided to include it in the book, but it was always an sort of an afterthought. So that that's why, and I, and I actually like doing the main story first and then doing the prequel after instead of having the prequel and then the main. So, um, so that, that, that worked out, but that was really just a little treat for, um, supporters who, you know, kept asking, when is the next thing coming? When is it? So I was trying to buy some time <laughs> for the second book. And I mean, look, it was a 20 page thing, so it's not going to fulfill any real hunger uh, for it. But, uh, but people were grateful and I was, I, it was just great to be able to put something else out in between. Yeah. 
and, 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 and I'm going to be jumping all over the place because I have like, just from what you just told me, I have three different questions. I want to go in different directions. But one of the first things I want to ask is, so so when Laws of Depravity ends, it ends with uh, something very, um, don't, no spoilers, but it ends with something like, oh my God, I can't wait to pick up book two. Right. <laughs> right? right. And and I haven't yet finished book two uh, and book three is in my hands. Uh, fortunately, I have a copy to, that I can get through. Uh, although I, I'll be honest with you, I'm very much wanting to listen to you read it because that's another perk or benefit of, right. of you having a, a great voice and being able to be the multi-talented writer and read by the author. Yeah, I just I, I figured you know, I just want to do it, do it all. So well, yeah. yeah, that's that's so cool. Is there a similar sort of? Um, I mean, everything resolves at the end of the first novel, and then there's something that happens where you know that, and and this is fantastic. So you get you you get Freeman, you get Kavanaugh, and then they're working in collaboration with Agent uh, Macklin as, as well. So so you know they're going to come back, which is fantastic. Right. Because it right. kind of looks like, you know, there's some stuff that happens where you're not sure, not sure. that that's exactly. going to happen. You do you carry them through all three books, right? Yeah the, um, the 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 concept of the franchise was that originally, of course, it started off with the two detectives. So it was yeah. uh, because of my my work in uh, film and television. Um, I borrow a lot and and am and, and, and inspired. I love movies. I love television. Right. So I'll take a general concept. So um, the first book was conceived sort of to be close to the movie Seven, where you right. have these two, um, the salt and pepper team, an African-American cop, along with an Irish Italian American cop, and they are the best closers of serial uh, killers in, right. in, in New York. So so you have that. So that's a great franchise right there. But then just to balance it out more, and it just organically became more interesting to me, I wanted to include a Jewish FBI agent um, who's female. And so the three of them form this really, like obviously the two partners are very close and they're also best friends. But then to throw this third entity in who doesn't quite fit with them, yeah. but you see their relationship evolve as they investigate these horrific crimes. So the cool concept for me of the, of the series is that each book focuses on, on one of them. So they're all very present and 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 relevant to the, all the stories right. but each character depending on like in the first book as they're investigating the death of clergy we tell that through the point of view of a cop who used to be an altar boy who was actually molested by clergy so that just gives that investigation just a slightly different edge um, the second book the african american character fee um, his father is was a famous gangster who is now, you know, gone straight. And she, he's right. a very powerful mover and shaker in New York, you know, straight. But he did a lot of horrible things in his past. And some of the one of the crimes that he committed in his past comes back and haunts them in his present. So, of course, Fee's point of view is a little stronger than Macklin or Kavanaugh's. And then in the third book, Laws of Annihilation, we are investigating uh, anti-Semitic hate crimes. And so having that told from the point of view of a Jewish female FBI agent, so she has the stronger point of view. So, But all three of them are right. very much yeah. you know, integrated into all the stories. But I lead a little bit more and explore the personal challenges uh, with each individual, which gives you that extra thing that you said where you're not always sure who's going to survive and if it, and they may survive physically but will they survive morally will they sur survive spiritually will they you know will they survive mentally and emotionally yeah so that's what to me makes an even greater thriller series because i think for the most part thrillers you know, people go in understanding that it's a good guy chasing a bad guy or multiple good guys chasing multiple bad guys, or, you know, but so at the end, you already know, in general, the good guy has to catch the right. bad. Guy. <laughs> uh, you know, otherwise, that's a failed protagonist, you know what I mean? Yeah, and there yeah. are certain instances where, of course, the bad guy gets away and certain things. But but my books focus as much on not only will they solve the case, 
will they save themselves? Will they, you know, because each one goes through so much personal, spiritual turmoil. Basically, they have to go through hell in order to come out and be whole and be made whole. And so the question becomes not just will they catch the bad guy, but will they survive as a whole? And, and that's not always guaranteed. And that's where I think people also, that's where a different type of suspense comes in because you're rooting for these people. And then you realize this might break them. They might survive, but it might break them for the rest of their lives. And I, I find that yeah. interesting. Yeah, there were, were many elements of that. Even the relationship that Kavanaugh had with his own past, and what had happened to him. And then even the way that when you set it up at the beginning, you weren't sure, like, is Kavanaugh a Dexter kind of character? What's going on here? Yeah, right? Exactly. Because the way you painted it was really suspenseful. So you had to keep reading. And then and then this this relationship that is uh, introduced in, into Kavanaugh is, is so powerful too, which, which was really amazing. So I'm so excited that you get to see the other perspectives from the other characters in more detail because you do get their perspective. Um, right. Oh, that is fantastic. Wow. I, I'm just so excited to to let people know about this series and pick it up. And so it seems you've done a lot of writing with Dick Wolf for programs, for television programs and stuff. And that happens well, a lot. No, no, no. I don't know. I don't I don't write. I direct and produce. You direct and produce. Oh, so no, no writing in that area, but you're no familiar. Writing, yeah. No, okay. yeah, no writing. I am. I was the executive producer for several years for Chicago PD. Right. Uh, I am currently directing and executive producing Dick Wolf's first show for streaming, which oh, wow. is, uh, yeah, which is going to be on Amazon Prime. And um, it, so it's his first foray into that. So I'm, I'm, I've am I'm directed the pilot and I'll direct several episodes of that. So we were shooting when, of course, the strike hit and we got shut down. So we're getting ready to start back with that. So I, yeah, so I'm much more of a, a director producer for him. My writing okay. is, yes. But I was just thinking that some of the elements in a in a, a serialized uh, episodic show, you know, mm -hmm. uh, shows you've acted in and also produced and uh, and and worked on, uh, th that's where you you do focus on different characters, right? So 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 this episode may focus on one of these main characters, yeah. and then it it cons and that keeps the interest that keeps it a lot more interesting too for some of the viewers because they may have a favorite. They may like, oh, I, I can't wait to see Kavanaugh's perspective again, or or Macklin. Right. We don't really get to dig into Macklin. I can't wait to to dig into that one. That's that's great. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it gives me some flexibility. And there's even a character that is a quote unquote small character, particularly in the first book. He has much more to do in the second book, but uh, he's just such a fascinating character. He reminds me of. Um, he was fashioned after Luca Brazzi from The Godfather, which was uh, Marlon Brando's right-hand man uh, right. who sleeps with the fishes. You know? And so I created this character called the African. And, uh, and his backstory, which is so interesting that I decided to also give him a book. Now, he's not a main character. Yeah. So the fourth or fifth book will actually be from his point of view and that's oh my god there's more okay because oh, yeah. he's a fascinating character as they interact uh with uh the african uh and right. and they but that and was they, a very they, small very small very role. small but he and still the, stands out but the, yeah. but the second book he has he has more and you and that's when right. you get to understand more of his things that if you just kind of wonder why is the guy missing fingers and yeah. when you first meet him you're like okay but then when you understand all that that he has done and all the things that he's been through uh so he's he gets his he gets his own books but first we make sure that the pro the three leads they have theirs right uh, and then i don't want to spoil it but then there's another character that we're going to also do a point of view of yeah oh that's great that's great because it's kind of like where what's the backstory where's this person from i'm hoping to get more that's fantastic i, I love i love that you have these plans i want to i want to go back a little bit to you so you talked about the fact that Prior to Sourcebooks picking this up, and I think I just caught this earlier today on your YouTube channel. It was uh, it was you giving a, a talk somewhere. It was a it was a clip from a talk where you had said, even though you are a celebrity, even though you are you know, a household name and people recognize you as Dr. Peter Benton or any of the other roles that you've played, it still took you ten years to land the publisher. Can can I dig into? your experience doing it yourself initially and, and what that experiment was like and then how did it work out for you to to I mean source books is a fantastic publisher how did that all work out well you know it took you know it took a long time 
And so in waiting, I just said, well, I'm going to self-publish. So I self-published and uh, we had a you know pretty good response, got some good reviews. I mean, they're, they're, you're hindered a lot when you self-publish. You don't get the big reviews. You don't get the New York Times, USA Today, Washington Post. You don't get the quote unquote legitimate reviews. Uh, because they don't do that with self-published books. So so there's a limit. You Obviously, you don't get mass distribution. You don't get there are a lot of things you don't get. But one thing that you do get is a lesson on how to use grassroots promotions and an approach. And so, and quite honestly, that never changes. And so even now being with a well-established publisher, as we're making our way towards the release of the uh, third book, we now this this book is the un, this book has never been self published. This is the first unseen book uh, that we you know that we're doing. So we get to now do it the quote unquote traditional way. Right. But having said that, we still employ many of the things that we learned in marketing and and strategy and and I think it's a combination. I think it's having a great machine behind you from the traditional way of publishing with the publisher. But I also think it's important for writers, uh, authors to have the grassroots, the book clubs, the um, the podcasts, uh, the just like just doing things that you can do. If you can get an interview, do an interview. If you can get book clubs, 20 people to come out, if you can get virtual book clubs, all of that stuff is considered more grassroots, hugely, hugely valuable. And so we are now blessed and fortunate enough to now integrate. Uh, so we're not relying on just one. Of, I, I think a lot of times people have this romantic notion, myself included, that, you know, when you're with a big publisher, everything is just taken care of and everything and it's going to be great. And it's, 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 don't get me wrong. It's great being with the publisher. It's great being with source books. They've been, you know, very, very good with me. Um, they've exposed me to, again, when, you know, you said you were at uh, the speech that I gave, that's all them, which I would not have necessarily been privy to. Right. But there's, but you can never, my point is you can never have enough resource. You can never have enough creativity as far as marketing your book, as far as getting the word out there. And and then when you come from a different medium like myself, and so when we talk about, oh, well, you're a celebrity, that doesn't always, that doesn't translate. Sometimes, sometimes it works against you. And I'm by no means bitching about being a celebrity. Um, yeah. But what I'm saying is when I went from acting to directing, there were a lot of doubters. There were a lot of people that felt, oh, he He's not a real director. He's an actor that wants it. And then all of a sudden they start going, wow, this guy's a really, but it took a while. Yeah, yeah. So can you imagine going from acting and directing and producing to author? And so you're not guaranteed because you have some celebrity that that's going to translate and transfer. And, you know, for me, the the, the cool thing is I respect each medium. I almost feel like I start over when I when I go into another because I have various ventures of creativity. So when I went from actor to director, I really I wasn't thinking as an actor. I started started over. And how do I think as a director? How do I learn as a director from a director's point of view? Now, once I started feeling comfortable with that, then I would put everything that I learned as an actor into it which gave me an extra thing and i'm considered a um performance director because of my experience with acting so now we take all everything that we've learned and then we start approaching being an author you start over you start really understanding the medium how do things work you you have to really humble yourself you have to truly humble yourself but if you're going with the attitude that well i'm an actor or i have celebrity or i this or i that that fails way more. There are a lot of celebrities that have not made that leap. And it's they're they're, they're different. They're, they're 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 very different mediums and you have to respect each medium accordingly. And I'm I'm I've always been good at that and I like learning um new things. And so that's how I approached it. And then um someone that was doing marketing f- for me that was in the business um had worked for a lot of the big publishing houses um had was responsible or, 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 or partly responsible for many um, New York Times bestsellers 
And so I, she, this person was working with me as a marketing person that I hired and our relationship was just so great and really believed in me and believed in me. So I asked her to become my agent. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and, 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 you know, then we started, uh, and that was eight years ago. And so we've just been grinding for eight years and doing what we can. And, and then she, it's her tenacity that then led to the connection to Sourcebook. Well, you know, we, we sent it out and we've been rejected by every major publisher at least three or four times. Wow. Okay. <laughs> per public, per publishing house, not. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, so there, there, there were lots and lots and lots of rejections and, but, you know, she just kept on and then we landed, we found a home that felt good and natural. And that's, that's what brings us here. Yeah. Yeah. I think one of the, one of the things I've always admired about source books is uh, Dominique's approach is very much with in-depth um, and, and lots of experience in big publishing and yet operate source books with a lot more dynamic and uh, maybe agility that is yeah. perhaps the, some of the larger play platforms can't move as fast, can't make those those decisions. Uh, so I think Sourcebooks has always been cutting edge when it comes to um, uh, comes to that as well. So it was probably you, you and your agent uh, when you found Sourcebooks was probably it sounded like it worked really well t uh, together. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. awesome. Awesome. Uh, I'm, I'm so curious because, you know, you you, uh, you joined the drama club and wanted you know because they're gonna because they're gonna put on your plays that you're writing for them, right and and then you had this really long-term wonderful distraction <laughs> as an actor yeah and, and and you went and you were trained as an actor at various at Juilliard and, and and places like that but were you still writing all along like were you still like the daily journals or what were you still working no on? no not not uh, as a matter of fact it had gone away for a while i was i was very very happy very fulfilled and had you know um started my career with success and maintained um levels of success and some better not not I mean it hasn't always been you know perfect you know there's yeah. the ebbs and flows but many more flows than ebbs, you know? <laughs> um, and uh, so I was very happy. And like I said, I would write more out of necessity. I would write if I had to direct a short film, What you know, no one's going to give me a script. I There were a couple of ideas I had for screenplays, both feature films, as well as pilots. I would, I would write those. And I discovered that I'm a, I believe I'm a better writer of fiction than I am even of screenplays, which is ironic because you would yeah. think I would have much more experience with screenplays. Yeah, on, um, on multiple levels. Yeah. On multiple levels. But I, there's something about being able to tap into the subconscious and tap into the mental and the history, which gives me a different type of freedom as a writer. Whereas when you're, of course, writing a screenplay, things are, unless it's a flashback, things are very present and you don't really understand the psyche all, always. You have to show the psyche. And here as a as an author, you get to show and talk, discuss, you know, it's not just one way of understanding the psyche and exploring the psyche. So I, I really like that. Yeah. One of the things I have to say, if I'm allowed to throw some compliments your way, is one of the things I've always admired about Michael Crichton's writing is when you read Michael Crichton's novels, they're very cinematic. You can very easily see what's going on, as well as dialogue. And those are two of the elements from your writing as well, that the dialogue is so wonderful. I, I'm listening, and obviously I was listening to you reading the dialogue, but as I'm you know, going for a run, doing chores, raking, all the things I'm doing this time of year, and I'm listening to it. I'm I'm completely losing myself and where I am as I as I get absorbed in the story because I'm visualizing that. And, I, and that was a a couple elements of the writing that I thought were amazing. Which also, I mean, that led to the suspense notches it up that much more. You're feeling right. uh, the the well, and there's some torturous moments in <laughs> and your feet. You're actually feeling this, which uh, which is really wonderful. I, I love that. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. No, that's a that's a uh, a. It's natural, but B, it's also intentional because the goal, one of the end goals, is to outside of you know making these best a best selling series, is to lead to either a 
streaming uh, show or a, a movie series. Uh, so they're written cinematically, intentionally. And obviously, look, that's how I see the world. I see the world in a cinematic way. So I, I don't know that I'll have a choice, <laughs> but to write that way anyway. But um, but there is intentionality behind it, which is to let people. And also to offer a, an alternative to certain books. Right. I write short chapters. I write right. for Toni Morrison once said she wrote her first book because she wanted to read it. And I think that that's a really powerful, impactful thing for others. I, I write for myself and for people like me, people with short attention spans, people that want to visualize, people that want to be right there and just the texture and the, the, the detail, people that are really smart and usually guess what's going to happen. That's why I have so many twists and big twists in my books, because while you're trying to figure out this one, I'm on to the next one. So the impact, for instance, of the end of Laws of Depravity, I, you know, I knew I had something where people were like, whoa, did not see that coming. And you know what I mean? And so when you have it, so every book has twists. So I write for people that's like-minded and and being cinematic is a is a is a choice because like you said whether one is listening to it on an audio book whether one is reading it i want them to just i want them to be able to smell taste hear feel everything that the character is going through so i write it in such detail that people go and that does amp up the suspense and the terror uh, of it all because you do feel like Oh, I'm right there. And and so I have I've had people that tell me I, I will only read your books during the day. I won't read them at night because they're just a little too too detailed. And then the other half of people, other half are like, how did this come out of your head? You know, like what what was your imagination? You know. Yeah. So the but the, the, that's what I write for people with vivid imaginations for and people with 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 not so vivid imaginations to help them. You know what I mean? If they can't yeah. do it on their own, then I'll I'll paint the picture for you in such detail that you will enjoy having a vivid imagination or, or reading the works of someone with a vivid imagination. Yeah. Oh man. Uh, and, and, and then the research involved too, because you had to do, uh, obviously did some research in terms of, I mean, for the first book, obviously some religious persecutions right. and things like that. Um, yeah. I, I imagine, how do you approach uh, the research? Are you, uh, are you a go visit the library kind of guy? You online uh, interview? I'm, people? On, I'm, I'm online. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I like to think that I have a lot of uh, semi useless information rolling around up here. Like I just, I read <laughs> a lot of trivia. I, I read and you, and once you can give it direction, once you become a writer, right. you, you now there's a place for it. So you don't, you might not know it when you're reading an article, when you're reading the word of the day, when you're reading whatever, or you're seeing something, you might not know, but you just, and then when you're, and then at some point you pull it out and you, and you use it. So my research, um, I've been very fortunate to have amazing technical advisors by working on ER, working on Chicago PD. So between medicine and, and law, I've got great technical advisors. Like, hey, is, does this feel accurate for cops? Is this the right part of the investment? And then my guy will give me some stuff that says this is, and so it just gives it much more authenticity. And and you know, my books have to pass a series of discriminating first readers uh, for different. I give it to the I give it to different people for different reasons. Right. When they sign off on it then it gives me the confidence that I have a very well-rounded, accurate story to tell. And, uh, and I, and I, I love sharing that. Oh, yeah. that's fantastic. Uh, I, I, is it okay if I ask, um, like your reading, are you a paper guy, eBooks, audiobooks? What, what, what I'm, a, I'm a old, I'm a, I'm a old fashioned paper guy. I love, I love the feel of a book. I love dog earing it. And I have some, some really cool bookmarks, which I use some of the time, but I'm just old. I'm just old school. I like, like yeah. turning the page back, I'll pick it back up. I like the feel of it in my hands. I mean, I read a lot of stuff digitally. Sometimes it's just convenient, um, but that's more so from my industry of reading screenplays, yeah. et cetera. But every once in a while, like, you know, an a, a manager just sent me a book 
um, digitally. Uh, and sometimes now you get books before they're published. So you feel good about that. So I can I can adapt. But if you talk about my first choice and my first love, it's just good old fashioned book in hand, comfortable spot. I'm good. Yeah. Oh, I love that. I love that. Okay. Uh, as we're getting close to to wrapping up the uh, the end of the interview, let's first let uh, my listeners know where they can find out more about you online. And obviously, I, I'm I'm sure that the the laws of annihilation as well as laws of depravity and and laws of wrath are are available everywhere uh the books uh, fine books can be found including ask for it at your local library um, exactly yeah so so yeah so and um have a great as you witness have a great respect for librarians and uh and just you know when we started this journey just understanding the power of librarians and purchasing books and helping. And so, yeah, so libraries, bookstores, obviously independent bookstores, uh, the big ones, uh, Amazon, uh, it's, it's, it's out there, which is, again, the advantage of being with a publisher, um, like source books, as opposed to self-publishing, because again, you get more mass distribution. Right. Uh, so the book is, yeah, buddy of mine, you know, and it's great. I mean, you know, we're in airports at Hudson News, and, uh, you know, you, you have these, these, I call them buoys of fantasy throughout your life and your career. And so when you start something, you go, oh, I'd like to see this happen. I can see this happen. And, and they're like, you know, when you're swimming in this wide sea, you, you, you just basically feel like, okay, I've, I've accomplished this goal. And now let me swim to the next one. Oh, I've accomplished this goal. And waters get rough, you know, here and there. You're like, I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to make it. You're, you know, you're, and then you call and you're, okay, I made this one. And yeah, like, you know, walking through an airport and uh, seeing your book on display. I mean, look, there's still a lot of firsts for me to experience. I, I think that, you know, I have a huge fantasy of being on a plane and someone just happens to be reading my book. Oh, you know, I haven't stumbled upon the stranger yeah. uh, with the book yet, but but it, yes, so, you know, being in bookstores, being in airports, you know, the availability of a good friend of mine was shooting uh, something in some little remote town and uh, he walked into the bookstore and he was like, man, your book is here. And so, yeah, it just makes you feel. Yeah, yeah. there's nothing very, like that feeling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Uh, are, are you, you're you going to be doing a tour or you've started to do the promotional tour for, for Laws of I have, I'll, I'll be in New York the week of, and we're doing um, several events in New York, doing some really cool events because book events aren't always cool. And uh, I want to bring, and they're not always sexy. So I kind of want to, uh, if they used to be, I want to bring sexy back. And if they're <laughs> not, I just want to add. So we're doing some really, really, um, we've got a great event in conjunction with Roche Beaubois, um, the uh, exclusive uh, furniture store, um, high-end furniture store. Oh, wow. uh, and what they're doing uh, an evening called On the Couch with Eric LaSalle. And oh, it's just, oh, it's just okay. really cool, you know, champagne and wine and me talking to people and being interviewed as people are sitting on $30,000 chairs, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so it's, you know, it was really good again, but it's cool. It's a cool New York event. And, you know, we, we've got some book club stuff there. So I'll be doing that um, as I have to, fortunately, you know, the strike is the, the writer strike is over. So we're beginning to get back to work. So I have to, the week after the book comes out, I go back to the Dick Wolf show. Uh, so then I'll be planning things sporadically when I can, because right, uh, right. I'm probably shooting for a month or so with Dick Wolf. And then once that, because we were halfway through, once that's done, then um, we will be, you know, doing other things, but I don't have anything yeah you know, booked right now. I got to get through that part. Right, of right. Now the rest of that Christmas season is people can get, you know, buy all three books and, uh, exactly. and go through the whole process. And, oh, I, and I do have people, I do have some really faithful readers that it's one, two, three, and I love that. You know what I mean? And the cool thing about the series is, you know, each book is also written as a standalone, yeah. but it has these cookies in it. These, these little rewards for the person that read the first book there's something in the second book that they're waiting for. Now, if you just pick up the second book and you start reading it, it's a, it's it can be a standalone book as yeah, well. Yeah. Oh, I, I totally understand it. Uh, the third book, so they're all written that way. So you feel you, you're covering both grounds. Like I'm giving you a special treat 
who's been following the series and there are these references and there are these payoffs, these, these cool little play, play up payoffs. Uh, but then again, someone just picks it up. They start reading like, wow, this was a cool thriller. So I, I like that balance and it was intentional. Oh, well, that's fantastic. So uh, one of the things uh, I'm, you inspired me in so many ways during your keynote talk back in August in Cleveland. Um, and it was the talk about finding a way that artists will always find a way. And, and, and I'm so inspired by the fact that, as a teenager, you dreamed of being a writer. You had a, uh, still have a great career, but right. then it came full circle and you came back and that you never gave up that dream. Uh, did you have any inspiring words or tips for aspiring writers who may be listening to this who say, wow, <laughs> like you, you did it, right? You've got the, the books are out. You've got a publisher. You and your agent worked for 10 years, eight years to to land that. Any words of wisdom for writers who may be feeling that struggle and, and all of the oppression that that's hitting them? Well, I mean, I, you know, nothing fresh. I mean, obviously it's tenacity. I, I think one thing is sometimes the world has to get ready for you. Sometimes the world's not ready for you. And what I mean by that is there are great people, much greater than myself, more talented than myself, if you think about it, they came, they weren't at the right time. And sometimes the world has to catch up. And so whether that's honoring them in death, um, and if you think about it, Van Gogh is considered to be one of the greatest artists ever. And in his lifetime, he sold one painting. Hmm. He sold one painting in his lifetime. But now see, so the world had to catch up to his talent. And right. so I think sometimes people have to, you work as hard as you can. You put yourself around discriminating people. You know, it's not just your mother telling you, oh, it's a good book, honey. You know, it's it's like really, really, once it, once it sort of passes the scrutiny of uh, people with discriminating taste and experts, et cetera, and you know you have something. And that's what my agent, which is why I made her my agent. That's the one thing she gave me. She she kept giving me seeing the vision, the appreciation of the vision. So I was I felt like I was on to something. And so it's validated when people are now talking about these two books. Well, these are the same two books that were written. The first two are the same two books that were written 10 years ago. Right. So if they're holding up now and, and people are seeing all this amazing stuff in them, I didn't change the books once I got a deal. It's the same book. So that means that that talent was there, whether it's validated or not. And I think as artists, as writers, as actors, as any as writer, and, and, and even beyond artists, but you know, the thing is like sometimes we just we just need the validation. And sometimes we use these big things as validation, but we don't always get them. Van Gogh didn't get the validation of being this very successful artist that he deserved to be during his lifetime. He sold one painting. And so if you ask, I would I would pass that on to people um, that are aspiring and frustrated and they don't think it's going to happen. They don't think, and look, all of us want our flowers while we're alive. Like I don't want to be a posthumous amazing writer i mean i i, I want to be half but I, but I'll, i want my success now as well you know what i mean let's just let's just keep it real you know what i mean so so you know we all want that so i would i would i would say every once in a while people have to remind themselves again only after they've passed the test because you can have so every writer thinks whatever they write is good for the most part i'm talking like stuff that you go this is a really smart person i know what kind of stuff they read i know what standards they're coming from and they're saying that this book is as good as anything they've read. Uh, and I kept getting that. That's the other thing. Listen to the messaging um, because people don't always say, people don't always know what they're saying to you, good or bad. And so you pay attention to the, and then so if people are kind of skirting around things. It's probably a weakness. They're trying to spare your feelings. So sometimes if they're not talking about something, you're like, oh, okay. Um, then maybe you can ask pointed questions depending on a relationship. But then also some of the things that they say, you go, this is a, there's a consistency here. And with that consistency, that's giving me the message, which is, this is solid, really interesting writing. And uh, so I, so I would, I would, I would say just every once in a while, remind yourself that maybe the world has to catch up to you. Maybe the, maybe the world has to catch up to your art 
Um, and you just keep swinging and swinging and then having obviously the right person or people that believe in you. Uh, and I had, you know, my, my agent that just kept pushing, kept pushing, kept disappointment, disappointment, had to talk me off the ledge a couple of times, you know, just, you know, all those things, but, you know, and then her family joined in and they were like, this book is as good as any of the top writers, I don't understand why he's not a bestseller. I don't understand why, why he never got a deal. Like they, and some days you, some days you just need to hear that. Some days you need to know that, oh, it is affecting someone. So I, I would say, keep that in perspective. And that's, that's what keeps you going. And you just continue to try to keep getting, if you've written one book, write two books. If you've written two books, write three books and you keep on swinging. Cause you don't know, listen, here's the truth. I'm, getting my success now because I've written three books. The third book got me the deal and they decided, oh, we will republish these. But so had, had I stopped after two and people think the first two are good, had I stopped after two, it wouldn't have this mass appeal that we're in a position of having now. So I would say to writers, if you've written one, write two. If you've written two, write three. If you've written two, if it's that important to you, you just keep doing, you just stay committed to the craft and to the work and the other stuff eventually works its way out by, by, by you attracting the right people, by you attracting, you know, you do things, the universe starts conspiring to make your dreams come true. If you, depending on one's spiritual beliefs, I happen to believe that. And I don't put my spiritual beliefs on other people. I'm just saying what works for me is that my job is someone once told me, even as a director, we were kind of bitching and moaning about some young directors that were coming up and didn't know what they were doing, but they were getting these huge jobs. And 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 he's a fellow director and he turned to me and he just said, you know, man, we are blue collar artists. And when he said that, it put me, put everything in a different person. It just means we just keep grinding. Yeah. We, we keep grinding. And, and, and that's, you know, obviously something that has made this country great is that mentality of just keep grinding, just keep, you know, working. Um, you don't control the outcome. Um, we all want the outcome to be successful. We don't control the outcome, but when you release, it seems to attract the certain, and then all of a sudden things start happening without you putting in major effort. It's just like, Oh, that, oh, that popped up because you're on the path and there's some interesting things. So um, I hope that answered your question. Oh no, that answered my question beautifully. <laughs> Thank you so much. I have to say, as, as your book is uh, about to launch now, you're probably familiar with the term break a leg, you know, for stage, yes. et cetera, et cetera. But I mean, you may not be familiar with the term I'm trying to get into popular uh, parlance for authors is break a spine because you know that means someone's reading the book right yes. the break the spine <laughs> so i hope you break a spine on the 24th with laws of annihilation and, and all best fun. wishes on that uh eric uh let please let people know where they can find you online i'm on social i'm eric lasalle on instagram i'm on facebook uh everything's under my name uh the, on, on tiktok so everything is under my name every once in a while uh you have to sort of get past the imposters because every once in a while an imposter comes along but if you, you you can tell i'm verified i'm you know all of that on all of, all of it so uh so yeah facebook instagram uh tiktok those are my you know those are my main ones so right and uh, we'll have links to that over the show notes and and, and, oh yes and of yeah. course and tw twitter what for, formerly twitter x or x yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, I'm, so i'm on i'm on i'm on the four majors and and like i said under my name verified on, yeah. on each account so that's how you know it's me. and it's eric with a q eric lasalle eric, yes e-r-i-q yes oh, awesome eric yeah. thanks for hanging out with me today hey thanks for having me this was awesome and uh really appreciate it and uh look forward to seeing it great thank you so just a few reflections on the conversation with Eric. Uh, first thing I want to reflect on is writing the prequel novel as a treat for his readers. Eric was thinking about his readers, thinking of offering them something to satisfy them while they waited for book two. So we can learn from that as authors of thinking of the readers first and not thinking of anything other than what can I do to satisfy them? What can I do 
to support and help my readers while they wait very patiently for that next book. And of course, that prequel novel can be used for author newsletters as a giveaway. It can be used, uh, you know, at the at the end of book one, which I loved. I got to the end of book one, and then I got, oh wow, the backstory of the bad guy. This was awesome. So again, thinking of the readers and how that can benefit you because you're thinking of benefiting the readers. The other thing was the reflection on on when Eric talked about needing uh, to humble yourself, and. And how that led to the respect that Eric has for every medium in which he operates, in which he creates, in which he performs, in which he writes, whatever it is, is he has a respect for the medium. And as creators, that's something that we need to constantly be aware of. Now, he's always defined himself as a storyteller, as a writer, and even though for decades he worked you know, almost exclusively in movies and television and only returned back to concentrating on writing a lot in the last 12 years, he approaches every single medium that he's in with respect. And thinking about us as authors, yes, we think about our books. Yes, we think about the stories we want to tell. But there's so many different emerging opportunities and emerging technologies for us as writers, creators, and storytellers, remembering to respect the medium. And in 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 addition to that, when you're respecting the medium, you're respecting the consumers, the readers, the, the people who are there to enjoy that story, that content in the medium. So that's kind of cool. There's the other thing that's kind of related is, did you notice that Eric often said in the interview when he was talking about stuff, he said we rather than I, and he did that multiple times during the conversation. It was a very subtle thing, but... I love that perspective. It's inclusive. And Eric is recognizing that while he is the author of the books, and you know, authoring is a very solo uh, profession or solo work when you're there and, and pounding the keys on the keyboard or however you're writing, but he's recognizing that he's part of a larger team. He's a larger team of the people he's working with, his agent, his publisher, his publicist, his editors, all the various people involved. He's recognizing them in his responses. And that is, again, a reminder of his expressing the need to humble yourself. And he's done a beautiful job of that in such a subtle but wonderful way. And then the final thing that I want to reflect on is Eric's idea of the world catching up with you. I think about my good friend Joanna Penn as a... As a you know, a forward-thinking indie author who's always been, you know, thinking 10 steps ahead of the rest of us and always looking forward. And sometimes she's been ready for things before the world was ready for those things. And and it kind of seems old hat to her. And, and, and oftentimes when you're a pioneer, when you're early on in things, the world hasn't caught up. And and, and that can happen to us as writers in, in terms of the books you release. I think about well, I also made some marketing gaffes when I first released A Canadian Werewolf in New York in 2016. I did some things wrong and it didn't seem like I wasn't ready. And maybe the world wasn't ready for me to relaunch that book in 2020 where I ended up actually turning it into a series. So this was maybe a combination of me not being ready and the world not being ready. So as a creator, think about those things. Maybe you're not ready for the thing or the world's not ready for the thing that you're doing, but you keep at it. You keep persisting. You keep working. Uh, you keep operating with tenacity. And, and again, a reminder, it was the third book that Eric wrote that sold the entire series to this amazing publisher, to Sourcebooks. And and again, had he given up after book one or given up after book two, that never would have happened. And it always leads back to what I always tell authors and will continue to repeat is patience, practice, and persistence as well. So I love that Eric encapsulates that towards the end of the interview. What about you? And what were some of the reflections that you had upon listening to this episode. I'd love to hear your thoughts, your own reflections uh, about anything that Eric and I talked about. You can leave that again over at starkreflections.ca or on the various social media channels because I love that engagement. I love to learn from you and what you're reflecting in 
these interviews in these episodes. But that is it for this episode. Thank you, dear listeners, so much for listening. and love that you're with me, that you're following along every week. And of course, I love your reflections. If you want to support the podcast, of course, we have the Patreon. But just leaving a review on the podcatcher of your choice, or better yet, sharing this episode or any episode that resonated with you with someone that you think would find value in the Stark Reflections. But as I said, that's it for episode 329. Until next week and episode 330, this is Mark Leslie Lefebvre wishing you great writing and good Stark Reflections. Thank you for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. You can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca. The music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomtech.com.